When word went out in the early morning hours of October 23rd that a deputy sheriff had been shot and killed in the line of duty in a marijuana grow in El Dorado County, federal law enforcement agencies in the Sacramento region, including this office, mobilized to provide any and all support we could to the sheriff and the district attorney. The FBI helped to process the crime scene. The ATF examined and researched the gun recovered from the scene. Homeland Security investigations determined that the shooter and his fellow marijuana grow guard are Mexican citizens who are not in this country legally. The marshal located and arrested a fourth suspect two days after the murder, and the DEA worked with prosecutors in this office to build a case for federal prosecution. I wish to emphasize that all of this was done in complete teamwork and collaboration with the Sheriff's Office and the District Attorney's Office. In addition to that, El Dorado County District Attorney Vern Pearson and I have been literally in daily contact many times, multiple times a day about this matter. I could not be more proud of the assistance that federal law enforcement has been able to provide to our local partners in this tragedy. It is a direct result of this collaboration that I make the following announcement. Earlier today, a federal grand jury here in Sacramento returned a four count indictment against Christopher Gary Ross, Juan Carlos Vasquez, Ramiro Bravo Morales, and Jorge Lamas. The indictment charges all four of them with the following crimes. One, conspiracy to grow marijuana. Two, growing marijuana. And three, discharge of a firearm during a drug offense. In addition, Mr. Vasquez and Mr. Morales are charged with being illegal aliens in possession of a firearm. The roles of each of the defendants were as follows. Mr. Ross occupied a piece of property in rural El Dorado County and when approached, agreed to allow marijuana to be grown on the property in return for cash. Mr. Vasquez and Mr. Morales lived in the grow and were tasked with tending to the plants and guarding the grow site. And Mr. Lamas was the foreman who ran this grow and at least one other grow in El Dorado County and took orders from a man in Mexico. Each of the marijuana counts carries a five-year mandatory minimum prison term upon conviction, and the discharge of a firearm count carries a mandatory minimum sentence of 10 years consecutive to the five-year terms. Each of the defendants is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. I wish to make a few additional points. One, the marijuana grow where Deputy Ishmael lost his life was illegal under both federal and state law. Law enforcement has learned that the Mexican criminal organizations have adopted a new tactic since the voters of California chose to legalize marijuana. They now approach property owners such as Mr. Ross and offer cash in return for being allowed to grow marijuana. None of this is in compliance with state or federal law. I note that earlier this week, the State Attorney General announced that nearly one million illegal marijuana plants were eradicated in California by local, state, and federal law enforcement officers this year. Three years after the voters of California approved legal marijuana, the black market in this state is alive and well and thriving. This prosecution is part of our efforts to keep our community safe from this threat. Two, at the outset of this investigation, there was some confusion about the legal status of Mr. Vasquez and Mr. Morales in the United States. That confusion has now been eliminated. I have been informed in the last 24 hours that HSI has confirmed that both are citizens of Mexico and neither has legal status in the United States. 
Thus, they are legally correctly described as illegal aliens. Three, I am often asked why I use the term illegal alien in the context of criminal charges like the ones we bring today. I am all too aware that it is politically incorrect in this state and much of this country to use the term illegal alien. However, in this work, we follow what the law requires. The applicable federal statute requires us to prove in a court of law that the charged persons are aliens, i.e. not citizens of the United States, and that they are in the United States illegally. Thus, the proper legal term under federal law for persons such as Mr. Vasquez and Mr. Morales in this context is illegal aliens. Four, the charges we announce today are in no way a substitute for or in lieu of any charges that Mr. Pearson has or may bring in this matter. They complement each other, and we are completely committed to working collaboratively together with the district attorney going forward. This past Tuesday, I attended the funeral of Deputy Ishmael. I presented his widow with a letter of condolences from Attorney General Barr and told her that my office would do all we can to ensure that justice is done in this case. I know I speak for all of us here at the podium today when I say that we are committed to working as hard as we can to reach that result. I now would turn the podium over to Mr. Pearson, the District Attorney. Sure. Thank you. Predominantly, I just want to uh, echo the comments of uh, United States Attorney McGregor Scott. Um, and by thanking all of the, the law enforcement, our state and local partners, uh, the federal partners, and uh, for their expertise, professionalism, and collaboration over the last few weeks. Uh, I have every confidence in investigation and prosecution uh, that we collaborate between the federal government and uh, the District Attorney's Office of El Dorado County. Um, uh, we'll carry forward with the same spirit of collaboration. Let me elaborate something for a moment and share with you what I witnessed in the hours after the shooting of Deputy Ishmael. Um, Despite the sad reality of what had happened uh, and what had transpired, um, the deputies, the detectives, the police, the members of the California Highway Patrol, uh, the federal officers from uh, ATF, from uh, the FBI, CSI people, the local CSI, um, it, all the various, and I'm probably leaving somebody out, because from, from the, the federal prosecutors, our, our prosecutors within our office, all of them exhibited the utmost professionalism to conduct an investigation that was transparent and uh, comprehensive and professional. Every interaction that I witnessed uh, with the public and the parties involved, including those that have been charged uh, with crimes both by our office as well as the, uh, the grand jury here in the United States uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, Every interaction was done in a highly professional manner and, as I alluded to, with collaboration and transparency and professionalism. I want to emphasize that point because, um, frankly, contrary to what most of us see when we turn on the no news and reflect upon the, the representatives uh, that all of us have elected and fighting and bickering amongst various government entities, uh, the professionalism that I have personally witnessed uh, reflects greatly upon uh, what, what all of us as taxpayers are entitled to have. And uh, moving forward as, the, as this prosecution goes forward, as I indicated, it's my hope that it'll continue in that same vein, and I, it's every confidence that it will uh, with that regard. So with that, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I, too, um, want to thank U.S. Attorney McGregor Scott for all the work he and his staff are putting into this case, and that's not only his office, but you know the FBI, the ATF, the Marshals, HSI, everybody from day one has been there for us. Um, he was one of the first calls that I received after losing Deputy Ishmael, 
and uh, he's been in contact ever since, including being there for us and the family at Tuesday's service. I also want to thank D.A. Pearson for his office's work on this case. His attorneys and investigators have been by our side through the entire investigation, and we're also there at Tuesday's service for Deputy Ishmael. I've had conversations with Attorney General Becerra, who guided my agency through SB 54, or the sanctuary state issue, with two of the suspects. Um, he also advised he understood our frustration with that issue, and also the issue of dealing with violence surrounding these illegal marijuana gardens. He advised he sees the importance of the resources such as CAMP, the Campaign Against Marijuana Planning, to help eliminate these illicit sites, and that he also was at Deputy Ishmael's funeral on Tuesday. I want to note that noticeably absent from my deputy's funeral on Tuesday was our governor. First, I want to make something clear, and I ask that you, the media, please call this what, that it, what this is. Don't soften it. This tragedy was due to an illegal alien tending an illegal marijuana garden who murdered my deputy. That's what it is. There's a man named Gordon Graham. He has decades of experience in law enforcement and law with a focus on risk and liability. And he has a mantra. And that mantra is, if it's predictable, it's preventable. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that what happened to my deputy was preventable. I'm sorry, was predictable. It was predictable that if you legalize marijuana and put in place a regulatory scheme, it does nothing more than drive that industry underground and allow the black market to thrive. We in law enforcement have been saying that for decades. If you allow criminally minded illegal aliens to infiltrate our communities with more protections than our average citizens, they will take advantage of that and victimize our communities. We in law enforcement have been saying that for years. So if law enforcement's been predicting these issues for years, why won't our legislators consider the advice we've given them? To the governor and the legislator, I sincerely hope and pray that you will reach out to organizations such as the California State Sheriff's Association, the California District Attorney's Association, the California Police Chiefs Association, the California Peace Officers Association, and many, many more that represent law enforcement for advice on how we can fix the deficits in the laws that could prevent what happened to my deputy. We in law enforcement are the experts on how to keep our communities safe. When your car breaks down, you don't call the pool boy. You call a mechanic. This is what we do. We live these issues. We know how to help fix these issues. And please let us. What we need is a measured and reasonable dialogue between our legislature and law enforcement wherein they take our input seriously. Keep us engaged in the conversation and give us the respect we deserve regarding these issues. I'm not so naive to believe that we will recriminalize marijuana in the state of California that we will completely repeal SB 54. I know that. But I also know that there are changes that our elected officials can put in place to help prevent these types of incidents in the future. Give law enforcement the ability to contact and work with our federal partners to rid our jurisdictions of violent, criminal, illegal aliens. Sheriffs and chiefs in the state do not and have no interest in carrying out federal immigration duties. But when we come across anyone that is breaking our laws and victimizing our residents, then we need to hold them as accountable as everyone, regardless of their immigration status. Regarding marijuana, law enforcement needs the resources to adequately control these issues. The state needs to complete its licensing and regulatory scheme and provide us the resources to enforce it while protecting those growers that follow the law. And allowances in the law that if a cultivation site is unlicensed, to completely eradicate that grow immediately to eliminate the attraction these gardens pose to criminals. California used to be the place to be. 
but it seems recently the number of people leaving the state is outpacing those immigrating to the state. Most claim taxes, cost of living, etc. But I'm here to tell you that if not already, soon it will be because they don't feel safe either. With incidents such as the murder of my deputy in an illegal marijuana garden, we will soon be hearing that they are leaving because it's not a safe place to live, work, or recreate. These are just a couple ideas to start the conversation. I sincerely hope that our legislators and our governor picked up this charge and fix these issues. To do so will make our state a safer place for all of us. Thank you. And with that, we'll take your questions. Sam? Um, Governor, can you tell us whether you plan charges against Lamas and their range? I don't want to comment on specific the facts of the case, uh, but I would say that, that uh, as far as Lamas, that the, well, let me put it this way. The people that we have per, uh, currently charged are the people at the, that we intend to prosecute at this time. So we don't think we'll be adding llamas. And can you, have you made a decision on pursuing the death penalty for either of the two you've charged with murder? Well, I think it's fair to say under the circumstances that um, uh, the investigation's ongoing and we have a policy that we follow to make that type of determination and we will not have made that yet. Could you seek it in the case of Ross? Uh, you, again, the investigation's ongoing would depend on all the different facts and circumstances. Well, <clears throat> we are still very much in the early stages of the investigation. That is something I should emphasize. We're not done with the filing of these charges and indictment today. We are continuing to follow this trail where it will take us. What I can tell you is that we are very confident in saying that uh, Mr. Lamas, who I have described as the foreman, the man who was in charge of at least these two grow sites in El Dorado County, uh, uh, reported to a man in Mexico. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions from that. But you can't say if that man was connected to part of. I, I, as I stand here today, I cannot. But uh, we all know what the historical patterns are on those things. And um, I want to, again, emphasize that the investigation is ongoing, very active, and we're a long ways from being done. I'm not sure who can comment on this. But so it's not it's a legal grow by state or federal standards. The sequence of events seems even more bizarre. I mean, it sounds like you've got a, um, I mean, akin to like a bank robber calling the, the police and saying, hey, one of my partners is ripping me off. I mean, is that accurate? I mean, is that, I mean it sounds pretty bizarre to me. Maybe it's, <coughs> The, uh, I, th I think the facts have been uh, fairly widely reported that the deputies went to that grow site because of a 911 call that was made by Mr. Ross. And um, beyond that, I don't really want to comment on the, on the facts, uh, and we're still trying to piece this all together. Let me, let me see if there's, ma'am. Thriving means that by its own study, the state of California says that 80% of the marijuana grown in California leaves the state, which by definition means it's black market. Thriving means that we eradicated a million illegal marijuana plants in the state of California in one grow season just on the public lands. Thriving means that you've seen all these articles in the Sacramento Bee in recent weeks about potential corruption around the issuance of cannabis licenses by the city of Sacramento. Thriving means that the Postal Service in our part of the world spends an incredible amount of time intercepting packages full of marijuana leaving the state and then packages full of cash coming back into the state. Thriving means that there are the overwhelming percentage of people growing marijuana in this state in an excess of six plants are not licensed per the state regulatory scheme. Black thriving means that the DEA 
the camp program, the sheriffs, the DA, we are all, we all still have our hands full of prosecuting cases that are illegal under California state law. There are, I think, people who are in good faith trying to come into compliance with this regulatory scheme that California has set up. I said this before this product was legalized. I'll say it again. It is an incredible level of naivete to say, oh, if we legalize it, the black market will go away. That is ridiculous. And all that's happened in the subsequent three years since legalization is to prove the truth of what I just said. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sam. Thank you. So if the Georgetown grow was an illegal grow as well, are there legal steps to be taken against whoever controls that? I mean, was it the same kind of setup where the people in Mexico were leasing this area to grow? The, George, the Georgetown grow, I, I think it's, we are safe in saying that it is a very similar grow site in, in concept. Um, but again, to make my point, we are continuing to run out the trails and build evidence and, and take it from there. And some of that, you said some of the details have been out here, but can the city expand on the sequence where it was actually, uh, the deputies were actually shot? I mean, were the suspects in the grow like sleeping or did they, was there some sort of ambush situation or did they appear to feel they were surprised and didn't know who was coming to get them? Or we're not going to try the case here at the press conference um, in terms of the facts, but, but I, I, I can tell you that the two of them were in the grow site when the deputies arrived, and the gun battle took place very shortly thereafter. Can you or Graham or anyone tell us anything about the gun itself? So we're still working that out. Uh, we, we have, in fact, identified the last lawful purchaser of the gun. That took place 45 years ago, 35 years ago. That person is now deceased. Uh, we're trying to figure out how this gun got where it got. We're not done, and we're not going to be done until we figure that out. But we're still very much actively trying to con determine that right now. 1984, how far, how many years? Is that 35 or 45? I can't do the math in my head. Somebody help me out. 35, thank you very much. But it was in the United States. Absolutely, yes, man and Bernie. Any other questions, ma'am? So, so, so my answer to that question would be this. Because it was illegal under state law, these organized Mexican grows typically would go up into the, the, the high country in the national forests, the BLM, the parks, and, and do massive environmental damage to our federal public lands and put in major marijuana grows because they didn't have to worry about anybody stumbling upon the grow sites and they could do their thing. Under the guise of legalization, these, they figured out that they don't have to do that anymore. They can go to Somerset and pay Mr. Ross $13,000, and he'll let them grow it right there, and they can drive the truck right to the grow site. And then, uh, and again, this has been publicly reported, but when Ross called into 911, he said he had a legal marijuana operation. Well, guess what? It wasn't a legal marijuana operation. So, so the fig leaf of legalization gives cover for those who operate in the black market to do their business. Sure, go right ahead. I think it's in, in light of a couple of the questions, I wanted to comment on this. What, us standing up here and, the, and what happened to Deputy Ishmael has nothing to do directly with the concept of legal marijuana. It has to do with the way it is managed and what the consequences and the collateral violence that has happened as a result of it. Just think about it from this standpoint. And I know there's a lot of people throughout California like, well, and we see it with jurors. Oh, it's marijuana. It's only marijuana. It's a victimless crime. Um, perhaps it would be a victimless crime if, if uh, the way this was managed was perhaps like going back to prohibition in terms of when prohibition was re repealed and the things that happened like that. But they went, there was a big struggle having to do with the black market and violence associated with it. But just stop and think about it with the, the legalization and talk about just El Dorado County and our county. So uh, in uh, 2016, Colorado, you remember, legalized marijuana. Uh, we had a homicide, uh, our first 
post-legalization of, of uh, uh, cannabis or marijuana um, homicide that I'm aware of in our jurisdiction was a, a business person, considered a reputable business person from Colorado, who traveled to California, met a grower up in South Lake Tahoe, and the grower was uh, a, the victim of a, a basically a dope ripoff that took place because people knew that he would uh, largely be carrying or likely to be carrying a large quantity of, mer of uh, cash after the sale. So, and he was killed as a result of that uh, robbery. We're currently still prosecuting that individual. And fast forward, in circumstances remarkably similar to this one, uh, another marijuana grow in, in 2018 in Georgetown, uh, a number of individuals went to that grow uh, in order to do what's commonly referred to as a dope rip. Uh, one of the people that was there uh, cultivating and maintaining that was shot and killed during that. That, that is what we are dealing with, the violence, the escalation of violence that has taken place because it's worth so much money on the black market and it hasn't been properly managed or regulated uh, uh, under the guise of legalizing it. So it's different than saying that the, the decision is not, is it, should it be legal or not going, being legal. It's what, how it gets done and what happens as a result of it. And the violence, uh, as the sheriff put, put it earlier, this happening was entirely predictable based on what's happened over the last three years. We've been struggling with sanctuary state law since I became the United States Attorney, and in fact, uh, uh, this office, in conjunction with the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., brought a lawsuit uh, here in the district court in, in Sacramento to have it declared unconstitutional. We did not prevail. Uh, we appealed to the Ninth Circuit. We did not prevail to the Ninth Circuit. We have now sought uh, certiorari at the Supreme Court on this issue because we went several days, uh, in part because of SB 54, we went several days without knowing who the heck these two guys were. And um, we did everything we could to try to get uh, HSI into the jail to interview them. Um, and and, I, and, I, and I, I think it's important to note, and I want to call this out, um, that the sheriffs are trying to follow SB 54 as best they can. And we're denying access to HSI to come in and interview these two guys. I personally called Attorney General Becerra. On, on the Friday morning after the murder, and he got right on it, and within the, within the constraints of SB 54, did everything he could to help facilitate this. But we shouldn't have to go through these hurdles to try to figure out who two guys are from Mexico who just killed a deputy sheriff. And so um, the, the SB 54, and I, and I say this as a voter. I'm not saying this is the U.S. attorney. SB 54 is called the California Values Act. I don't find it to be a California value in any way, shape, or form that we deny federal law enforcement the ability to work hand in hand with their local law enforcement partners in determining who the heck are two guys from Mexico who just killed the deputy sheriff. So those are my thoughts. If I feel angry, if, I, if you get the sense I'm angry today, I am angry. I am angry. Because we have illegal aliens in an illegal marijuana grow who killed a cop. That is bad. What, what exactly happened uh, in terms of SB 54 preventing your people from figuring out who they were? And what Do you want to speak to that? What, I mean, take us through the steps of what impediments you ran into. So once we had two suspects in custody, we knew that they were Hispanic males. And I believe that's all I gave at the first press conference was Hispanic males. Um, then the process starts, who, who are these guys? Who's going to talk to them? How are we going to talk to them? we got interpreters, all that. Um, to get their identification, I can't call the experts from ICE, from Homeland Security, from anybody to come in and help us with that investigation up to the point where, where uh, uh, U.S. Attorney Scott was, was in my office um, he had just got off the phone with Mr. Becerra. Um, we were trying to figure out ways to make that happen, that we could, we could get some, some of their experts in to help us. Um, I ended up on the phone with Mr. Becerra that morning, um, and we came up with a way to help, at least help us get started. 
Um, we followed the guidelines of SB 54 because legally I can't even talk to them. Um, but luckily we had some FBI partners in the room that uh, can and knew what was going on and they were able to eventually work around the hurdles of SB 54 to at least start us down that path. That should have never happened. I should have been able to call HSI ICE in the morning, said, hey, I got a couple Mexicans in my garden, in an illegal, illegal garden that just killed one of my deputies. We need to know who they are. They should have been able to come up, work with us all the way through this investigation. And right now under SB 54, that cannot happen and does not happen. I'm, I'm prohibited from doing that. A day later, almost? It was, it was on the Friday morning, Friday uh, after the murder, so two days later, and only after um, I asked the Attorney General to personally do what he could, and he did, to his credit. He reached out directly to the Sheriff's people. His people reached out directly to the Sheriff's people, and we tried to figure out a path forward. So that brings up a good point. Two days, we just heard. And I don't know if we're going to learn through this investigation, but we may learn that other suspects in my county tied to this group may have fled. And where did they flee? Who knows? If we'd have been able to be there earlier, we maybe have been able to prevent something in the future. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. A few months ago, or actually last December, we saw a similar incident in Stanislaus County when we lost one of our deputies and the sheriff said that he believes it was because we did have an illegal alien who is the accused shooter in that case. He also blamed California's sanctuary laws on this incident. So do you believe that these murders on our police officers are going to continue to happen in the state of California until you either change um, these sanctuary laws or repeal them? I'm going to let the sheriff answer that one. That's an easy question, and I thank you for that, because it's an easy answer. Yes. Ma'am. Absolutely. So I'm looking at one of my advisors right now. <laughs> um, very much so. And as at the same time, I'm asking for his help and his support to listen to us. Just a couple days, I think, before this incident, or maybe right after or after this incident, um, he tweeted the President of the United States because he believed the President didn't have uh, any knowledge of what we were dealing with, um, didn't believe in climate change, so therefore he, the President was dismissed from the conversation. So a huge, huge part of me wants to look our Governor in the eye and tell him, you don't understand anything we're dealing with, so you are dismissed from this conversation. Yeah, it did. It was, uh, he had an important meeting with PG&E. And I understand that is something that is affecting all of us um, in the North State um, tremendously. My county as well. We were off for days on end. But one morning out of his busy schedule to respect my deputy and his family, I don't think it's too much to ask. Okay, one more question and we'll be done. Anybody else? Okay, thank you all very much for being here.